few weeks ago, I met a guitarist called Stacy Gray, whose band Trial Kennedy were all over the radio and the charts when I first got to Australia in the early 2000s. But this video isn't about the band or the man, but rather about this guitar. something different this episode, so let's revisit this guitar the last time we saw it and have a look at it today. I think I see the problem. We have an almost vertical neck break which is the worst kind. That's okay, this guitar is going to live again. We don't have a headstock so we can't do a fix and we've got a set neck. Which means in order to release this neck, we're going to have to dig it out. After a couple of calls to the lovely team at Maton Guitars, they were kind enough to send me a care package. Now this neck is a short scale electric guitar neck and the problem with that is Maton stopped making both electric guitars and short scale necks quite a while ago. So when I called, they had to dig around the factory and luckily, we were able to find, apart from this lovely ebony fretboard, straight off the CNC, this short scale MS2000 neck. This is the last one in existence, so we called it just the right time. It has its headstock laminate and the truss rod is installed, so that's great. Also in the box was a plastic bag, as you can see, and in it are a couple of Maton water slide decals. We've got some fretboard dots. We have a very shiny composite nut. And much to my relief, because I hate doing it, they supplied some pre-radiused fret material. That's a pretty great care package. It's not the case, however, that we can simply glue this together. Taking a closer look, we can see the laminates in good condition but the neck is straight off the CNC and does have some damage from kicking around in a back room at the factory for so many years. Really clean, nice truss rod installation, which is exactly what I'd come to expect from Maton. The fingerboard's been drilled for dots and radiused on the CNC, and as you can see from the stripe down the middle, it's going to need some hand radiusing. This fretboard type is also designed for binding, so I'm going to have to find some binding and smack that on there. Luckily, I make electric guitars for a living, so I happen to have a lot of this kind of stuff lying around. Binding comes in a few different sizes, so I'm just putting this on either side of the fretboard and having a feel with my index fingers. And I can feel that that is pretty close. It will need some trimming but this will be the right size binding for this job. I'll just make this look nice for all my OCD people. Ah, uh, that's nice. <laughs> As with all Luthery related endeavors, we're going to need some special tools. These are just bog standard irons that you can get anywhere. Now it's time to dig that neck out. And the first order of operations is to very carefully break the clear coat surrounding the neck. Luckily, when the headstock came off this neck, it caused a bit of damage and there's already a crack all the way around the outside. So I'm just going to cut all the way through that. And that way, when the neck comes out, I'm not going to lift off any parts of the front of the guitar body with it. I've just hit an area where I can't cut and that's covered by this master sound nameplate. This is Maton's clever way of covering up the truss access cavity. This allows me to get into those last two little corners and break off the last remaining parts of that clear coat. Then of course, we have to do the back and the sides. 
To make this job easier, you can heat the finish with a heat gun, but because there is so much binding and plastic in the area, I'm just going to cut this cold. The great thing about nitrocellulose lacquer is when the new coats are applied, they'll melt into the old coats and that will essentially delete any of the cracking that we can see. Okay, this is where things start getting brutal. I'm not planning on saving this fretboard, so here I'm just using a mini chisel and I'm introducing a little notch in either side between the neck and the fretboard surface so that I can introduce a paint scraper into there. Boing, highly professional. So the move here is to use the iron on the frets to generate a bunch of heat that will radiate downwards through the fretboard and into the glue join between the fretboard and the neck. This is going to take a while. Steam, of course, can also help in this regard. So if you wanted to, you could wrap the neck in a moist piece of cloth and that would release steam into the joins as it heats up. I, however, am an idiot, so I won't be doing that. I'm gonna go low and slow on this one and just take my time. You can tell I'm doing that because I've actually left the room. Okay, I'm back now. So I'm using my paint scraper to just push through the glue layer between the neck and the fretboard. The beginning of these types of jobs is the time where it takes the longest. So I've made some headway and I'll just put the iron back on there for another few minutes. About five minutes has passed and things are getting pretty hot. So rather than being sensible and putting some gloves on, I'm just pulling my hoodie over my hands. You can see just from that move there that we got quite a bit of mileage out of that last heating, heating time. So I'm taking advantage of that and just cracking into it as quickly as I can. While it might look from the outside like things have started to cool down, they really haven't. It's still very hot in there, so I'm just trying to break that seal some more and get as far up the neck as I can. That's about as far as I'm going to go for now. So reheat. As you can see, we've made some good progress here and we're in the home stretch. The glue is still fighting me every step of the way, which is a great sign of just how well mate on glue their bits together. Hey, look at that. We're nowhere near finished. Now we're at the next stage of things, neck and next, I guess. And so I'm using a damp cloth with my very special water container there. And we're going to heat that up and let that steam try and penetrate into the sides and the bottom of that neck joint. Also give the guitar a bit of a scrub. We're back on with the iron and I'm going to press down. You can see things are starting to get steamy already. I'm not going to leave the iron on for as long as I did with the fretboard because the steam is going to do the job a lot faster. Normally at this point I'd cut away to where the iron had finished but I figure a lot of you are going to be watching this wanting to know how to do it so we're doing this in real time. Iron off, cloth off and I'm ready with my mini chisel and again I'm just going to get in there and break that little seal that is the beginning of the glue joint for the neck. It looks like I'm not paying much care to the body, but I am. The sloped surface of the chisel is facing away from the body, so I'm being very careful and cutting straight down. So any wood that's being sacrificed here 
is Neckwood. On a side note, I'm going to be making some changes with the channel over the next little while. Just want to make it better. Stuff like shorter intro sequence and all original music, which we're already doing. One of the things I've been thinking about is what do you guys want? Do you want more long form videos or do you want the kind of videos that I've been doing where I cut away during extended sequences like this one and get to the next piece of action? I know some people and I'm one of them actually like to watch videos and just chill watching people make things. If that sounds like you or the opposite of you, leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. There's really no point in me making all the decisions around here because I'm not actually the person that watches these videos. So as you can see with our mini chisel, we've started to make a tiny little bit of progress and what I want to do is just keep ramping down like you see. I think it's time to maybe start a little montage of progress. took a really long time but it came up nice and clean we've got lots of lovely flat gluing surfaces to glue our fresh neck into but before we do that let's put in some dots these dots as lovely as they look are just made of plastic which makes them an ideal set of candidates for CA glue but before we do any gluing, I'm just going to have to sort them out. Some of them have a slightly yellow color on one side. So I just want to make sure we've got all the nice white ones facing up. We need some paper towels for cleaning up spills. I find it's a lot easier to have a couple of sheets pre-torn on hand ready to go rather than trying to do it one handed when you've got glue everywhere. I just popped one of the dots into the hole to see how deep Maton have drilled them out. And they've drilled them out a bit deeper than the plastic dots. Of course, they did that on purpose because the fretboard isn't yet radiused. At least, not all the way. We've got a rough radius, but there's a fair bit of shaping to do with a radius block later. So. I'm just going to pop the dots in, try and align up the grain of the dot with the grain of the wood and then wipe away any excess that's on the surface. 
We do have a little bit of open time with this kind of glue, not a lot, but enough for me to do four at a time. And so the look here is to put them in the hole, duh, but not all the way. And if you find that your grain of the inlay isn't lining up with the grain of your timber, then you can get some pliers and twist it and then push it down all the way. Mine, of course, went in perfectly the first time, except for this naughty little one that came out when I was cleaning. There he is. Decided I don't like that one, so we'll put him to one side. Maton were lovely enough to include one extra dot in the bag, so look at that. We made it. With the dots in, I can now put a couple of little spots of CA glue under the nut, and that's going to go onto the neck which will help me situate the fretboard correctly. So this isn't to glue it on forever. And most techs will agree when gluing on a nut, if you're going to glue on a nut, you actually don't want it to be there forever. You want to make sure that the nut can be removed for maintenance in the future. Silly Temple Guitars did all of that off camera. <laughs> there we go. Now that nut is there as a placeholder, I can put the fretboard in and it will sit at the right point. Now we've just got to wrap it up in some binding. Like I mentioned before, this slightly oversized binding is the best candidate for this job. Now when it comes to glue ups, the best place in the workshop to do them is on the hardest and flattest surface that you have. So in my case, that's the table saw. So you can see I've set up a little clamp area there with a fence. And once I catch this binding, that will allow me to press the binding up against the fence and to press the fretboard up against the binding. I'm using acetone to melt the binding into the fibers of the wood. So you want to make sure that the sides of your fretboard aren't too smooth, that they haven't been sanded with too high a grit. If they have, just a very light touch with some 120 or 240 grit should open up the grains. And again, there's no need to push down. Just let the sandpaper do its own thing. And we're off with the binding. So as you can see, I've got myself a little binding sandwich there. The acetone doesn't take too long to work. And I like to do just a small section at a time. Now that the acetone is setting up, I can put a little bit more on the top of the fretboard surface and that's going to wick down into our acetone and fretboard area and help to get everything all melted together. That's literally as long as it takes. So now I can open it up and work on our next little section. Dip the dedicated acetone brush into the acetone, paint the fretboard side, press that binding up against it and up against the fence and a little bit more along the join. It's that simple. And as long as you're patient, you'll get really good results doing it like this. 
now we've reached the corner and some people panic <laughs> when they get to this point but it's just more of the same a good thing to do is to warm up your binding with a heat gun if you're so inclined but this isn't that much of a tight corner so i'm quite happy to just warm it up with my hands and gently convince it to go around the corner So there we go, lots and lots of wiggling and jiggling and that's heated up the binding enough to allow us to make that curve. Then when we want to stick it to the fretboard, we're just going to use the same technique. We'll get some acetone, but instead of pressing the side up against the fence, obviously we'll have to press the end up against the fence. Now we're around the corner and I'm using a little bit of a clamping system that you can work out just by looking at it and that's sandwiching everything together so I don't have to hold it with my hands and we're clear. As you can see everything's a little bit dirty at this stage and the binding is protruding up above the fretboard. This is all completely fine. Also going to have a few black marks around the outside of the binding and we're going to scrape all of this stuff away so it'll be fresh and white and lovely. There's the old fretboard. There's a new one. I think that looks pretty great. I used some fret trimmers to trim off the excess of the binding and now we're going to stick it down to the bench top and give it a radius sand with a radius sanding block. Here's a tip for removing the backing off double-sided tape. Scratch away from the corner first with a fingernail and that magically realigns all of the electrons. No, I don't know what it does, but it just seems to work for some reason. I moved this setup over to the table saw because it's a lot flatter. And after 600 years of sanding, this is what we get. That's using 120 grit on a 12 inch radius block then it's 240 grit 300 and 400 grit now all that sanding's done it's time to do something about these frets like i said before they came pre-radiused which is great so i'm just marking one here so i can trim it to length clip and then once that's done i can lay it down on the fretboard and using the binding as my guide, I can get the dimensions I need to set up my tang removal system. So here's that. This is my fret loader. So I've put it in the slot. I put the clamp down on it, but I don't press down yet. I load it by pushing it into place and clip it. Then I bring it over to my fret tang trimming jig, which I showed you how to make in the last episode. Just a quick kiss on that. Do it again on the other side and the tang is removed. Sorry about this terrible camera work. I've got a new camera. I don't know what I'm doing. If you're in Australia, this is a nice alternative to tight bond. It's a white PVA kind of glue, but it dries clear as opposed to yellow. So it's quite nice for this application. There's a little hole there I probably should have masked over We're getting ready to glue this fretboard on this is one of my favorite tools ever it's a silicon brush and the reason it's so good is because when you're done smearing your glue around you can leave it to dry and then grab the bristles with the glue on them and just pull the glue off so it's basically a self-cleaning brush. Now we're all gluey and I'm just going to grab some silicon with a little sticky and I'm going to push that down into the hole 
and that'll just keep all the glue out. I always keep kebab sticks around for exactly these kind of jobs. And there's no need to worry about the silicon drying and gumming up the truss rod because it stays soft and pliable forever. If you like, you could just use paste wax for this job, which would smell wonderful, or you could do it properly and mask it off in the first place. So at this point, I've added a bunch more glue. Some people might say, that's too much glue. I'd, I'd say it's fine because I like to see a fair bit of squeeze out evenly um, around the entirety of the fretboard as I push it down. And having this much glue gives me that as an indicator. So here I go again with the old salt trick, just a few grains. There we go. That should make the neck taste lovely. And what that does for the uninitiated is it acts like a soluble clamp that will dissolve in the glue once it's done its job. Just pushing the fretboard down onto the glue now, making sure with my fingers that it's nice and scented. I feel good about that right there. I'm grabbing some Stew Mac, not sponsored, uh, binding tape here. <laughs> it's very strong stuff and adheres really well. And I'm just going to use that to band-aid my finger apparently because I just cut it. Okay, and then I'll grab some more and we're going to hold the fretboard in position using some tape. Just clear my work area there. So I'm going to bring it around one side. Make sure, absolutely sure, that everything is centered because you really only get one shot at this. Pull it tight, which is the great thing about this tape. And push it over and then we'll do it again on the other end. Now, tape is nice, but having four solid metal pegs holding your fretboard in position is better. So what we're doing here is I'm going to miss that truss rod, which is right down the middle there, and drop a couple of holes in the heel end in one of my frets. It doesn't matter which one. And the depth doesn't really matter because it's the heel end of the guitar. When you get to the other end, it matters a great deal. So you want to be more careful there. All five of these drill bits are identically sized. So as I drill a hole, I push one of these bits down into the hole and it's very, very tight. Then when I'm satisfied that it's at the correct depth, I can do the next one. If you skipped the part where you taped the fretboard into place, the second drill hole that you want to put in would be diagonal from the first. So that would be at the headstock end on the player side, on the base side of the fretboard. We've got ours nicely taped down though. So here we go. The cool thing about this technique is the holes, if you select the right size drill bit, are thinner in diameter than the width of your fret. So that means once you're finished fretting, these four holes will all just magically disappear. Now we're at the headstock end, or as Kenny Loggins called it, the danger zone. What we want to do, what we absolutely want to do here is put some kind of depth stop on our drill bit and be very careful measuring it out so we don't drill through the back of our neck. Because that sucks. This is clearly not a very high tech solution, but it works great. Okay, so I'm lining it up now. Watch this. Measure twice. Drill once. Here we go. Starting off slow and just gently bringing it down to the level of our tape stop. And, oh no, no, I'm just kidding. It's fine. 
We didn't just accidentally destroy the last Maton short scale electric guitar neck in the world. Here goes round two. Again, just being really careful, not pushing down hard, trying to keep it straight. Any wobble on the part of the drill bit might accidentally make the diameter of that drilled hole visible from underneath the fret and we clearly don't want that. One other thing is you have to have pretty tough fingers to use this method because those sharp drill bits will strip all the skin off and make you bleed pretty easily. Okay, now it's time for the bondage and rubber section, or the fetish section of our video. I'm just going to strangle the headstock here. What I want to do is twist it over a couple of times. Which is easier said than done because we've got drill bits sticking out of the fretboard and it's very long. But once I've got some good pressure going, the intention is to use the rubber band as a big clamp all the way across that fretboard and neck. This is a bit of a blooper reel because it, it honestly takes me quite a while to get this to work. I'm sure there are luthiers out there that have a system. I'd love to see it. Don't forget to stab yourself on those drill bits. So we're trying to keep constant pressure here as we bring the rubber band around. I just stabbed myself in the spleen and pancreas just there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you just keep winding it around until we get to the end. The recommendation officially is to clamp your fretboards down every two to three inches. So this is a little bit less than that, and that's great. We've got nice even pressure all across the fretboard. Now we can leave that to sit overnight. It's now the next day, and I'm going to clean up this binding with my Gibson style binding scraper. The awesome thing about these is you hold them like a pen, and as such, it's quite a familiar grip, and that means that aiming the tool is a lot easier. So here what I'm trying to do is cut away and blend the bottom of the binding where it meets the neck surface, but I don't want to touch the fretboard side of the binding at all. And so as I travel down here, just gently taking off, I'm barely pressing down, just gently taking off that transition between the binding and the neck so we can get a lovely crisp line there. Now you can see we're really starting to cut into the binding, we're getting some nice plastic shavings. It's important not to press down too hard when using this tool, otherwise you can create a juddering effect along the plastic. I feel like that's pretty nicely evened out, I still have some blending to do and that will wait until final sanding. Time to check the fret slots for depth and consistency. For this, you can just use a feeler gauge with a pen mark on it. If you'd like to make your slots a little bit deeper or if you've had some material fall into a slot, maybe some glue and become lodged in there, Stumac do these two tools that make life so much easier, I'll link them down below. I'm not sponsored, but uh, I just love these tools. They saved my life so many times. I feel like the fretboard's in a really good place right now, but it's time to return some moisture to it. I'm using Dunlop brand lemon oil for the fretboard. And again, it's one of my go-to products that I just can't live without. Obviously I'm exaggerating, but it's, it's really good stuff. You just smear it on, let it soak in for a minute, maybe rub it in with your fingers, and then buff it off with a clean cloth. All of that moisture reinvigorating the wood will help to make it swell up a little bit more, and that makes the frets, as you're pressing them in, have to go in to a much more snug pocket, which is 
absolutely what you want. All of the frets are pre-cut and so I'm just test fitting them in the slots now. You can see those tangs have been removed off the ends so that we don't push them down through the binding. There's my serious face I'm concentrating. Normally you're meant to mount your fret call press thingy onto your workbench. I obviously haven't done that here. The workshop is moving from the country to the city, so these jobs will have to wait until I'm relocated. If you get yourself one of these fret presses, make sure that when you use it for the first time, that you don't crank down on the arm as hard as you can. These things are super strong and have the capacity to actually push the fret material down below the level of the fretboard, which is obviously something nobody wants. Now they're all nicely seated and I'm just trimming the ends, flush trimming the ends of all of those frets closer to the edge of the fretboard. This block with the right angle file on it is going to finish the job that the flush trimmers started. So I'm just very carefully rubbing it up and down the length of the neck. It's on a Teflon block and that's very slippery. It's a non-marring surface. Because there's more frets or they're closer together up towards the heel end of the neck, that's where most of the resistance is. So the key here is just to push it up and down, let the file do the work, and you'll know when it's finished because all of the resistance will be gone. I'm at the point here where I can feel the resistance has stopped. So I'm going to flip the file around and use the angled side of it. And this is going to put a nice little bevel running off the ends of the frets to the sides of the fretboard. The same rules apply here, just keep on pushing until the resistance stops. to the build now where it's time to start doing a setup. So I've taken it to my job which is this cute little music store in Melbourne called Found Sound. We'll take the long way around to my workbench. Working in this store is a little bit like working in a submarine, but we do what we can. I'm being ably assisted on this job by Sammy from Rumoro Electric. I'll be sure to drop a link to him down in the description for some of the most oddball cool pedals you'll ever see in your life. What we're doing here is just opening up the grain on the surfaces to be glued so that on a micro level it will create more gluing surfaces. Not pressing hard, just creating a, a nice little scratch pattern. Here comes the neck and Sammy's pushing it down into the pocket. Nicely seated and not too tight either, that's a very important consideration. Otherwise you push all your glue out. These clamp handles are a little bit close together so it's making tightening them a bit harder than it needs to be but the rule of thumb here is bring the work pieces together with a bit of force but not too much so if you're really straining to turn a clamp handle then you're a bit too tight. Sammy's cleaning up the squeeze out with a lightly moist cloth, so just a, a little bit damp. I'll give a free guitar to whoever can guess how many hairs there are in this picture. So the neck's in, and there's one little thing that's been annoying me, so 
Let's just grab a toggle cap from the parts bin and install that on there. Oh, doesn't that look great? Before the glue's had too much time to set up, I like to stick a couple of pieces of string on there and just check my alignment. If you've watched my neck shaping video, then you already know what this is, and if you haven't, I'm just doing a light crosshatch pattern with a pencil, just a normal old pencil. And that way, as I sand, I can easily see where I've been. And it helps to point out areas that need special attention. So here's a couple of areas that just didn't feel right to my fingers. You can see how long this neck has been sitting around because as I sand, I'm revealing lovely fresh wood. Once the neck radius has been taken care of, then obviously it's time to smooth out the transitions. To save myself time later, I like to pre-install things like the tuners. And that way, when this has been painted, I can assemble it again much faster. So I'm lightly attaching the tuners on with the washers and nuts, and then using this piece of aluminium L section, I'm able to ensure that they're all nice and straight. Then I use my trusty awl to center punch the holes, drill them out, and you'll see I've made a flag of orange tape there to ensure that I don't over penetrate with the drill bit and come out the front of the headstock. Look at how far we've come. We're using locking tuners here, so the strings don't need to be wrapped around the post. You just push them through the hole, tighten the locking tuner, and give them a clip. And there we go. So all the bits are on. We've technically remade this guitar. And now it's time to do fine tuning. So here I'm trying to get an idea of the straightness of the neck. I strung it up first because I want to see how it behaves under tension. Now the next straight and I can use this under string fret leveling beam to level out all the frets. You have to be careful because I don't want to hit the neck pickup while I'm doing this. But with a bit of perseverance, I'm able to remove all of my blue pen lines. Now I'm back at it again with the blue pen, this time to mark out the frets for crowning. I want to remove all of the blue pen from each fret, except for a little thin strip across the top of each one which we call land, and that is the crown of the fret. Then I use this file to round off the fret edges, what they call hemispherical fret ends. I'll do a full in-depth analysis of my fret work at some stage. For the purposes of this, we'll just rush through it. So the frets have been touched up by a number of different files by this point, and they're covered in fine scratches. So what I want to do is even them all out and get them buffed up, get them nice and buffy. So the first step is to protect the fretboard with all this sticky tape. 
and that sticky tape and this one. I'm starting off with a 1000 grit Aberlon pad and the green thing is a stack of my old business cards wrapped in painter's tape. So as you're going up and down, you should get a cool kind of vibe happening. And that means that you're getting right in close to the fretboard surface. Off camera, I repeat this process with 2000 grit, 3000 grit and 4000 grit. And each time I change direction. So here I am going in the other direction. Once this is done, it's time for paint. And here it is. Like I said before, the layers of nitrocellulose have melted into each other. So it looks like this neck has been on it all along. As you recall, we've already done the tuning machine mounting. So it's just a matter of popping them back in and aligning them with the pre-drilled screw holes. You may have noticed that we've changed location again. Found sound moved to an absolutely enormous new location. And so hopefully this is going to be home for a while to come. I gave up the old place in the country. So the workshop that we all know and love is unfortunately now a garage for somebody else. Here we are with the lemon oil again. And this time I'm giving it a good massage into the fretboard before I wipe it off. So you'll recall we've already sanded the frets to 4000 grit and now it's time to use some of this Wenol metal polish. I just wipe it on there, let it dry for a little while and then I can buff it all off again and that will give us a next level showroom shine. I'm not very good at applying it. So if anyone's got any tips, I'd love to hear them. These are Dremel style attachments that I buy in bulk off eBay. They're very cheap. And once they're attached to my knockoff Dremel, I can use them at very high speed to buff the frets. And this is what that looks like. some string to the two outside positions and what this will allow me to do is work out the string spacing of the high and low E string. Then I can mark that spacing and using a string spacing ruler, I can get the string spacing for the other four. So here I am measuring from memory, I think about two and a half millimeters away from the edge of the fretboard. And then using this string spacing ruler to determine the positions of the other string slots. I will in time do a nut making and nut slotting video. Just for now, we're going to race through it. Due to successive COVID lockdowns, it's taken six months to finish this project, including this video. So I apologize for my absence. If you chuck me a follow on Instagram, I do daily tips there. Hopefully this has given you some insight into just how much work a restoration involves, but also how incredibly rewarding it can be. We finally made it. I'm so glad we did and I hope to see you next time.